I, I do want to add to what um, Mark was saying about our program. Um, I, I've been in residential care for going on 20 years plus, and so moving to an intensive outpatient program was quite a change for me. But we have such a unique program therapeutically that the intensity uh, the good in terms of the quality of the work is amazing, uh, particularly given that it's an outpatient setting. Um, and I think a, l a large part of that is the, you know, the, the wonderful team that we have and how we, uh, how we work very, very collaboratively. Uh, and uh, I just want to throw in that you know, I'm just really, really pleased that I, I got to be a part of it. So, um, so Lee, is, Lee and I are all timers together. We, Lee's director of Beacon House for 18 years and clinical director and has a chemical dependency uh, expertise. And sort of I've come more from the trauma field. So um, I, I love that we get to interact on a day-by-day -day basis and learn from each other. And uh, we, we found that we have a similar interest was in doing attachment therapy. And he is uh, basically, uh, I would say, uh, his training is more uh, classical. And uh, he goes psychologist and uh, really hardcore Winnicott um, and Kohat and uh, all the wonderful egos state. Uh, folks, and so as we come at it from different directions, it's been you know pure fun to sort of um, you know, play together uh, with ideas and such. So uh, it's going to be interesting to hear from each other because we get to share our wisdom. So, yeah, hopefully, we'll have a great debate before it's, before it's over this afternoon. Right. Now, the nice thing about the model that I work from, um, it's got parts. But it's only got like two or three parts rather than tons of parts. So uh, when, when Mark and Laurie start talking about ISS, uh, even though I'm very, very intrigued by it, and very impressed with it, I always get a headache. <laughs> okay, uh, firefighter's going to do this, and exile's going to do this, and um, they are so facile with it. Uh, it, it, it literally is magic to watch them work. Uh, and I'm just beginning to kind of appreciate how, what a wonderful model that is too. But nonetheless, so we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about, are you going to get out of the way so we can see the screen? Thank you. Oh. Um, I wanted to, before we get into the first slide, which I'd like to do, we're going to kind of go back and forth. Um, I woke up about four in the morning and realized that I didn't do a slide uh, that I think is really important, and that is what are the what are the for me personally as a clinician what are the points that if, uh, that I want everybody to walk away with? So I wrote them down, and I'm going to give them to you now. And after I do that, you can go to sleep because you know everything uh, about what we're going to talk about. But I do think this is important. And um, you know, the first point I want to make is that innately, we are all coming into this incarnation hardwired for intimacy. It's just the way we show up. What screws it up are all the vicissitudes of uh, the development that we go through. But bottom line, there's a core, core in all of us that basically wants to connect and relate. And sometimes I think we forget that. And it's very simple, but at the same time very elegant. So we're going to talk about intimacy disorders uh, and attachment. So the other, the other point I wanted to make is um, we don't get true intimacy with fractured self-structure. Uh, and what that simply means is the more fractured our core self is and the less accessible it is, the more we have to rely on defenses to, to get through. Uh, and the more strained those defenses get, uh, the, the less we're able to be intimate and the 
more we rely on reenactment in our relationships. And I think that's really important. Um, the third thing is secure attachment or earn secure attachment um, supports core self structure. So that means the more if we come if we end up with dysregulated attachment, one one form or another, as we begin to heal heal with that, the more core self we have available to take care of business. Uh, and the uh, fourth thing is the, the quality of internal schema or emotional maps or what I like to call the internal working model, these are all guides that affect, influence how we relate to our, not only ourselves, but how we relate to the people we get close to and how we form those relationships. Um, and if we've got a reasonably good emotional map for connecting with people, then we can be intimate. But to the, to the extent we have less of that, again, it becomes more, relationships be, become more based on doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different outcome. And when it comes to addiction, we all know that doesn't work very well, right? Um, then the last thing I want to say, uh, the other last point I want to make is that when you work from an attachment perspective, one of the wonderful things about it is we can change. Attachment changes. Uh, we, may, we may start with disordered attachment, but it just takes one really positive, nurturing, caring relationship to change that. And I think that's remarkable. I think that is so flipping amazing. Um, and I think that, I think part and parcel, that's where all the parts work that we do at Harmony Place comes into play too. It's doing the same thing. It's reorganizing what goes on inside of ourselves so we can do what we came here to do, and that's connect. Do you want to comment on any of that? Sure. Always. Of course. <laughs> You know, we come to these conferences, we get a lot of gobbledygook, and we go to leave, oh, great conference, and you go back to your office and do the same thing, because you didn't really get anything practical. So, I always think to myself, what am I going to take from this conference to do different with my clients? So, here it is. As Leah said, what is it that I'm going to say to you today? I, I have struggled with um, treatment failures. And I realized in my own evolution that the first step was learning how to do trauma therapy, which I've talked about this morning. And I learned that it was good stuff and it was necessary, but rarely sufficient. And so then I had to go back to the drawing board and ask myself what was missing. And so that's where um, Alan Strofe and, and uh, Agawa, his student, followed these 270 kids from traumatic families. They found out when they grew up that they had a dissociative disorder. So it was cause and effect. So disorganized attachment causes adult dissociative disorder. Okay, that's important. Because it means that there's a fragmentation of the cell system. So we've got to figure out what to do. So when the person said, okay, so what do you do if you have somebody who does not have a core sense of self or is operating from a false self? And of course, you know, Masterson wrote a book called In Search of the Real Self. Um, he wrote three books on um, working with the real self. Um, and so many of those folks back then really where they got this sort of idea, but now we have a database to go with it. Now, if you dissect out disorganized attachment then, 
you have to identify what are the components of it. So Lori and I got trained in the adult attachment interview um, by Mary Mann and her folks. And uh, what we learned to do was to score it and to identify here are the 20 ways that a person has disorganized attachment. And so what we did is we went back and we said, okay, what can we do to, for people who don't have these things to change? Let me give you an example. Let's say the number one component that moves somebody into a, a, a strategy which is not very secure is if they idealize the parent. So if you give them a paradigm to do something to break that idealization, that would be important. So let me just give you an example. Let's say, uh, here's the story. Uh, my, my dad and I are very close. Give me a story that goes with that. Well, you know, he, my dad was a really proficient with uh, wind instruments. And so once a week he would take an hour and he would give me that hour and he would teach me to play the flute. And my love of playing the flute uh, is directly related to my dad's diligence in being able to teach me the flute. Is that secure attachment, avoidant attachment, or disorganized attachment? That story. It is avoid. Why? Because my dad and I were very close. Is learning to play the flute once a week with your dad very close? The story does not match the outcome. And um, being proficient in the flute is not the same thing as intimacy. So if he was, if the person would have said. Tell me a little bit about your relationship with your dad. He said, well, my dad um, was very interested in teaching me um, a great deal and would put a lot of time into um, teaching me a skill. That would be an accurate statement. But to say my dad and I are very close and use an instrumental behavior such as learning the flute, it, being very close is not instrumental. It is an example of very close is my, I was sick one day at school. My dad was in a meeting. He came out of the meeting. He picked me up at school. He brought me home and got me some chicken soup and put a hot rag on my head and read me a story. That's very close, right? Okay, you get it? So the way people can talk about these things is really quite important. Now, what we would do is we would give a story like that and then have the group say, group, what do you think? and let the group sort of go after the, this kind of thing and break it apart in some way. Now, what did I just do? I broke down idealization. Idealization is my dad and I are very close, and what's the story that goes with it? Now, what you usually get is my mom and I are very close. Um, as a matter of fact, you know, I was fighting with her just the other day, and she was yelling at me because of so-and-so, and when we broke, when we, when we made up, um, we were able to hug. Okay. That's very close, huh? So most people, uh, it's the way they use language is important. Now, why is, that, why is this story important? Because what Mary Main discovered was we'll never know what really happened in childhood. You know, there's no such thing as real memory. All memory is uh, constructed. But the way a person talks about their relationships with their caretakers is statistically predictive of so much of their adult behavior. And you can tell from that. So if you use the adult attachment interview, you can predict with 75% accuracy what the attachment style is of a mother uh, with her child before the child is even conceived. So if you came into me and I gave you an adult attachment interview and you were pregnant, I could say the attachment style of your child is going to be avoided. And I could predict that 80, 75 to 80 percent accuracy. That is incredible because you know human beings are so complex. So this is a very potent instrument in predicting adult behavior. Get my point? So you don't have to get fooling around with is this you know is this real memory or false memory? 
it's the way a person organizes their information in their mind. Well, that's good news for therapists because so much of what we're doing is narrative work and reconstructive kind of work and reframing kind of work. And the real goal of therapy is being able to walk through your past without rose-colored glasses and to be able to put the pieces of information together with as little bias as possible so that two and two equal four. And, you know, if you are alcoholic and sex addict and um, uh, cutting on yourself, uh, we can bet with high degree of accuracy that you didn't come from just a Leave it to Beaver kind of family. And if you say you came from a Leave it to Beaver kind of family, then it becomes the job of the therapist and the client to reconstruct the person so that it's a coherent narrative. Coherent narrative means that the output relates to the input. Got that? The output relates to the input. So if someone says, I came from a Leave it to Beaver family and I'm doing opiates and I cut on myself, there's, some, there's, a, there's a monkey in that woodpile. And our job is to be a detective and find the monkey in the woodpile. Got it? Okay. Shall we do our slides? No. <laughs> um, um, i got to share a little something about Mark as I, as I look at this slide. He, he and I have done a, a couple of talks together now. And whenever he gives me the his slide packet, and I look at what's in there, I, my first response is always, what the hell? What's, what's this mean? Um, and I have to look at it over and over again before I finally see, oh, there's a lot of wisdom in that. Because it, oftentimes these are very layered. Uh, and they, there's much more to them than just the, just the content. So anyway, um, what's love and violence got to do with intimacy? Good question. But I'm just going to read this. Uh, the soul needs love as vitally and urgently as the lungs need oxygen. It may not be self-evident to healthy people just how literally true this is. For healthy people have, have resources of love that are sufficient to tie them over periods of severe and painful rejection or loss. That's important. And that's secure attachment with the ability to feel and deal with whatever comes up. Uh, similarly, one does not realize how dependent the body is on oxygen until one is nearly suffocated or has had to resuscitate someone who is gasping for breath. Uh, but, when one had, but when one has worked with deeply seriously ill human beings, the evidence of the need for both oxygen and love is overwhelming. And what that means is when people are not connected up with what goes on inside of them, they're not aware of what they, what they don't have. Um, and, and that's a large part of the process, is begin to get them hooked up into that. The kind of man I am describing protects himself from the emotional suffocation of living in a loveless atmosphere by withdrawing of love he has begun to feel from everyone and everything in an attempt to reserve for himself whatever capacity for love he may have. But his supply of self-love is also deficient, and it cannot grow to the dimensions that are necessary for health when it is not fed by love from others. If it were not deficient, he could afford could afford to love others, but his withdrawal of love from everyone and everything around him not only protects him from emotional pain, but it also condemns him to the absence of emotional pleasure and joy. For we cannot enjoy the people who make, make up our world, cannot enjoy being with them, except to the, to the degree that we love them. So the person who cannot love cannot have any feelings pain, or joy. So talk, talk about self-object in relation to that. I've got a plan here. We're going to get to that. Um, see, I get you. Right? Okay. Am, am I doing okay? You're doing great. Okay. 
But a joyless, joyless life is a synonym for hell. A man who does not both love and cannot love is, in effect, condemned to hell. His entire environment, from which, without love, he is cut off, he is without enjoyment for him. For him. And this, and the world he lives in is a source of emptiness and emotional suffocation. Both the world and the self are experienced and perceived emotionally as being dead, inanimate, without a soul, without feelings. Boy, what a contrast between the beginning of that and the, and the end. And I think those last two paragraphs really describe, I think, the patients that we work with and why they come to see us. Um, when I read that, one of the, I, I like movies. I like to use movies as metaphors and stuff like that. And what I thought of with that particular, those last two paragraphs, um, do you all remember Carl Sagan's Contact, the book? Uh, and then they made a movie of it with Jodie Foster, and she goes down a wormhole. And, um, basically, the whole point, she, she encounters this sentient being that they constructed this travel system and they're, begin, they're gonna let humans begin to learn about it, yada, yada, yada. But there's a really, really poignant piece in that interaction. And that's when the, the alien who looks, was made to look like her dad who was dead, looks at her and says, when he's talking about human beings, we are capable of doing so much, and at the same time, we are, we are all totally alone. And I think that's, I think that's the, the core of what we work with, when we're working from, from this kind of model. Um, and I think that the, the, the point of that is that the only way we can begin to experience who we are is through the mind of another person. And that starts the moment we, we come into this, this incarnation. We, we learn who we are and we experience who we are through the mind of our caregiver. And very, very important uh, patterns are laid down around that that determine how we're going to relate to ourselves and other people as we progress through life. That basic template is laid down in a really, really powerful way. And the point is, is that we can't do that alone. It takes, it takes another mind to help us connect with that. And I think that says a lot about what we do in therapy. Because what our patients, how they learn about themselves, is how we reflect them in our mind when we're working with them. Make sense? Sound too, sound too abstract? Too weird? No. So, we have a client, Lee is treating, and he um, was driving his car last week and <clears throat> had his two young children in the back seat, and uh, he passed out with a uh, 0.35. Should have been dead. And um, his kids opened up his eyes for him, and uh, some pretty came by and called the police. And uh, so, you know, you scratch your head and you say, how could he do such a thing? Right? And, you know, the answer would be he's an alcoholic, right? And I hate that answer because it doesn't explain anything. Okay? It's like God, you know? God explains everything and nothing. Okay? So I scratch my head up. Why did he do this? You know? Because he's an alcoholic. <laughs> so. Why did he do it? The answer. That he has been suffocating ever since I've known him. I've known him a while. He, he's gasping for oxygen, and no one can see it because you know he's got a beautiful, you know, talking heads. Look at my beautiful house. Look at my beautiful home. Look at my beautiful BMW. Look at my beautiful kids. No one knows that he's gasping for air. You probably are not used to talking heads being used in one of your workshops. Anyway. Um, why is he gasping for air? Because 
because kids are self objects. Want to explain to them what self objects are? Well, sim simply put, a self object is anything outside of ourselves that we use to assuage or stabilize what goes on inside of us, particularly painful, painful affect. Um, so, in addiction, the substances or the behaviors that we come to rely on in, an dependent, in a dependent way are in fact a type of self-object. Because in a very predictable way, if you take, if you drink a, a fifth of liquor, it's very predictable what's going to happen. You're, you're going to go numb and dumb and not have to deal with what goes on inside of you momentarily. Point being, this man's a narcissist. He's stuck at an adolescent stage of development. And everything in his life he uses in order to be able to feed himself because he's deficient in self-love. And when you're getting your kids and you're using them to meet your needs, you're not there as a parent to meet their needs. You see the difference? He, his capacity for empathy and compassion is gone. And so the point I want to get at is that getting him sober is easy. But letting him begin to have a life worth living, as Marshall Whitehead says, is much more difficult. And I am not satisfied with sobriety. I want the person, I want to help the person create a life worth living. And so he's crying for help. He's desperate. And what we do is we miss the red flag by putting out the fire and taking away his alcohol. But we're missing the fact that he's saying, I'm dying in here. Can anybody see it? Can anybody help me? Get it? So addiction is always a cry for help. And you do a person a disservice by taking the addiction away without really listening with your third ear about what it is that the person's trying to communicate to you. And I think that they're always trying to communicate that they don't have enough oxygen. Okay. You, were, you were so right. Except. 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 Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's an old Jewish saying, or you can tell me if I got this right. You don't try to cure the flu but when your house is burning down. Does that sound good? Sounds Jewish, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Did you ever see point counterpoint on Saturday Night Live? <laughs> Jane, you ignorant? No, okay. All right. So now I want to say one thing intelligent, because it's probably the only thing I'll say in this lecture, which is what Dan Brown says is that there are three components of attachment. I just want to lay it out to you as a framework. One of them is the attachment that occurs from 18 months to two years of age. And that is sense of motor attachment. And it's mostly communicated by affect. If you leave a kid in a crib the whole first year of life, do you think that affects them? Yeah. yeah. Okay. But when they come in, are they going to say, oh, I was left in a crib, that's why I'm so screwed up? <laughs> because they do not have narrative memory. But they have sense of motor memory. And sense of motor memory, you can find it. I, mean, we've, I can show you a picture of it. Uh, it's been identified in the brain where it occurs. Then from 18 months to about four is the beginning of narrative memory. And with narrative memory, um, there's something which Dan Brown reminds us of called a core relational conflict. And the core relational conflict is how, like for example, if you think you're a piece of dirt and you've that's your schema. Um, you're, and you find somebody who is just incredibly wonderful. It's going to be like a magnet, a plus and a minus, and it's going to be difficult. So your core relational conflict dramatically affects the percents of yourself and other and your mate selection. And then the third aspect of attachment is what he calls the trauma bond. And the trauma bond is heavily what is called reenactment. Reenactment has its basis in Freud's concept of repetition compulsion. 
And with repetition compulsion, people get trauma bonded and they tend to repeat that which is unfinished. And so what happens is if, you, if your dad was alcoholic and you couldn't stop him from drinking, then you might pick three alcoholic husbands unconsciously and repeat that and reenact it in some way. And so people find themselves kind of in Groundhog Day repeating the same patterns over and over again until they can break the trauma bond. So these are not separate. These are superimposed upon one another. So that if you have disorganized attachment and then you have the belief that you're a horrible person and people mistreat you and then you um, are uh, sexually abused, you're going to have one superimposed upon the other. But it is important to break these up because the way you treat this problem is different than the way you treat that problem, which is different than the way you treat that problem. So all this conceptual stuff is useful because when someone says, well, what do you do with somebody who can't love? What one has to do is recognize these three components and be able to separate them in some way. As an example, and then I'll shut up, is that you get the core relational conflict replayed in your transference and counter-transference. And so if the person um, somehow uh, believes that everybody's going to leave them, and therefore they better leave them before the other person uh, leaves, they better leave the other person before the other person leaves them, you're, you're going to find them sabotaging the, the therapy, and you'll be able to see it happening right in front of you. And if you get defensive or reactive to the person acting out, you're going to miss the whole point, which is their job is to act out, and your job is to receive it and be able to help the person see what they're doing, why they're doing it, and what to do differently. So you're going to heavily work in the, in the transferential relationship with, with, with this phase. That's not what you do with this phase or this phase. Got it? So we're going to talk to you about all three. Just quickly, what the last attachment is from what year to what year? The, the trauma bond. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Be, it can be any point. Yeah. So it could start at five and go definitely. Yeah. I mean, trauma is trauma. So it's it, it just processed differently at one age versus the other. So, for example, if you're sexually abused and the family handles it in an optimal way, it does not have to be anywhere near as detrimental to the person's development as if they don't. So these things are, are not so simple. Can I, can I hear you correctly earlier this morning when you said 90% of the folks you're working at, working with the Harmony Place, have disorganized CASA, not the other attachments? Right. And, and CASA, would, I was running an eating disorder center where we actually measured it with, with the adult attachment interview. We have a hundred and tall tap interviews. They all come out as group organized. And in the study I ran, I said that our success rate in treating eating disorder is going to be more related to changing their attachment patterns than to the diagnosis of anorexia bulimia or um, what we actually do with the anorexia bulimia. The ones who had long-term success move towards an insecure attachment. So at Harmony Place now, Attachment interviews, is it the same percentage for disorganized attachment? We're not, we're not doing them now, but, but my guess is from clinical observation, it doesn't look any different. It's going to be really, really close to that. Uh, people, people with secure attachment don't go into treatment. Right, I was saying about say probably the majority of the folks that we see really have disorganized attachment, and that's what's really phenomenal about our program is we work with that uh, very successfully uh, with the models that we use. Um, and I, I always like to keep things really, really simple, and particularly when it comes to this stuff. Um, and I think a, 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 a notion you can, you can take with you is that when a patient comes in to work with us, there, 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 there are two levels that they're operating on. The first level is what's called the expected response. Ex if, if they have uh, uh, an 
anxious attachment, they're going to be really, really focused on being abandoned and pleasing. Um, but underneath that, what we really need to see and what we really need to understand that lives in all of this stuff here is what they really want us for us to see what, what, they, what they need and to begin to address that and not, not get beguiled by uh, the red flags that always wave in front of us. Uh, and I think that's really important. You can, this can get really, really complicated in your mind, um, but if you can kind of just come up with really, really simple concepts, um, it's a little less daunting when you, when you think about working that way. Then, oh, I'm glad you went to that. You want me to go first? Yeah. Oh, so uh, the triad for relational disturbance, I think what Mark meant by that when he put that particular slide in is those are the three venues that we have to pay attention to anytime we're working with somebody. Um, and that when we don't pay attention to those three different elements, sets of elements, uh, we're missing the boat. Am I right? Yeah, I mean, the way I think of it is attachment work is what we're talking about for the next hour. How do you do attachment work? And that's the 18 months to two years of age. Self cohesion um, is uh, what we're, you asked this morning, which is what do you do to, to facilitate the development of the real self? And that we have to begin to look at in a very structural kind of way. And then the affect work is what Lori was talking about, which is that when she does psychodrama, she wants people to remember what it felt like and to re-experience the pain. And in that, it's more grief work. One time, we were trying to show a videotape and it didn't work. So Lori said, well, why don't I do some work with you? I said, be my guest. And uh, so she did a psychodrama with me at the dinner table. And uh, there were about 500 people there. And, you know, within about 15 minutes, I, mean, I was crying and crying and crying. And I couldn't believe she got me there. And, you know, everybody in the audience was like, oh, you know. And then, um, like, for like a month after that, I felt like, you know, a shotgun had hit me. And, you know, it's just, she had an ability to be able to uh, get to a level of affect that I, you know, that I didn't even have any idea, you know, was in there, like a reservoir. And um, so uh, that affect work is a critical piece of this. And so much of the, like, uh, affect accelerated psychotherapy, which is Diana Foch's model, so much of that is like psychodrama and other forms of somatic and expressive therapies is an attempt to get to that piece. And then the cognition or schema. And IFS and schema therapy are incredibly useful for changing the structure of one's belief systems about self and others. But by conceptualizing the components of this, you can begin to think about sort of each, each uh, part of the elephant. <clears throat> what I want to add to the attachment piece, uh, when you work from an attachment model, it's not only important to understand uh, your, your patient's attachment state of mind, um, but it's equally important to understand what yours is, because the two interact in very, very powerful ways. Uh, and there can be a tremendous amount of complementarity there work in a really positive way, but probably one of the prime ways we get into a lot of difficulty with the patient is we miss that. We, we miss the, the uh, dynamic that goes on between what goes on inside of us and what goes on inside of them. Um, so I think that's really uh, important. I want you to know that Lee does not have any control issues. But this is his remote. How did you get there? <laughs> <laughs> I 
and I'm in control. Hello, Clark. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I screwed it up. <laughs> I want you to know I would never do that. <laughs> <laughs> give it back to him. I can't walk you through this. So, look, this is the model, which is that, you know, Lori said we're all screwed up, and we are. What happens is that, you know, we, our caretakers, school peers sequentially wound us, you know, in varieties of ways. And um, so we split off parts as, you know, people be mean to us, people hurt us. You know, it's like, Kids walk up to you, hello, how are you? And then the parents grab them, you know, and by the time you know you go to the airport and they're five years old, they're hiding behind their parents and they don't want to come out, they're beaking out with one eye, right? You know, so we protect our children. And they, you know, they, 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 the vulnerable, wonderful self gets covered over. As that happens, our unconscious self get <clears throat> it should be, um, the right. unconscious self gets bigger and the conscious self gets smaller. And that's called constriction. So we split off parts of self. And so when you become constricted, you, you lose yourself. This vibrant, hi, my name's Mark, what's yours? You know, all that gets covered over. And it's like darkness comes over us. And um, our unconscious gets bigger. And then we set up defenses. And so our defenses are be, you know, be uh, aggressive, be controlling be self-absorbed, uh, get symbiotic and need somebody to protect from danger. So the, the bigger your unconscious, the more defenses you have to have in some ways. So then you, you become somebody who denies their needs. With an anorexic, it's like you, they do not want to have any needs at all, even appetite. And that's the greatest success is if you don't need anything. So in that, you feel alone, you're dying without oxygen, you fill your emptiness with things, food, drugs, work, money, sex, spending, starving, whatever it is, you have to fill the emptiness with in some ways. That's a self-object. And then you have self-rejection, self-hatred. And then, uh, because we're a bonding species, we project that disowned part of self on partners, which is projective identification, which then begins the essential conflict, um, re resist the gifts of connection, uh, and positivity, and it goes around like that. So, in this model, it's much more robust than just the core relational conflict model. It's basically saying all of us carry burdens, and the burdens that we carry with us come from all the painful things that we've experienced. And if we look at our how defensive we are and the way our defenses are, this is so useful um, because it. It's our way of protecting ourselves. So in marital therapy, this is what's where your primary focus is going to be. Because in marital therapy, closeness and distance is mediated by this in some ways. So the way we do marital therapy is we, we see a couple, and whenever we get to a stuck point, like one person's angry at the other, we move it into to an internal family systems model, and we look at the anger and what it's bringing up for them from the past. And so we believe that in most relationships, the problems two people are having with each other are simply a projection of the unfinished business with their family of origin that they're then pasting through projective identification on their partner. And our model dealing with that is we'll see the couple and we'll wait till we get to a stuck point in their relationship and then we do individual work with one of the individuals in the room with the partner observing. So then the partner says, holy shit, this isn't about me, this is about his mother, isn't it? And we're able to say, right. And then she becomes much more cooperative rather than feeling like he's been attacking her. He's really, the real issue is not her, the issue is what he's projecting on her. Does that make sense? So um, it, it's a really beautiful model of couples therapy. Um, <clears throat> I just want to, to that in particular because how, how that struck me when I was looking at, at this the first time was that resistant part it, it's what we miss out on it uh, demonstrates all the things that we miss out on when we operate with uh, strident defenses 
um, we aren't able to take nurturing, emotionally nurturing, nurturing things in to sustain us. Um, and the longer this goes on, the less the less we're able to do that, and, and the more empty we become internally. Um, So when I was trained in marital therapy, um, it was all communication skills, anger management skills, um, all that good kind of stuff between two folks. So I remember I, I went up to one of the great leaders in marital therapy and I said, what about in trust like you think to him say? This was Jacobson. And he said, what the hell is that? And I said, it's one's relationship with self. You've got to have an I before you have a we. He said, I don't know what you're talking about. So I look sort of bewildered because this to me seemed like the missing piece in all those marital therapies. Because if you hate yourself, how can you possibly have an intimate relationship with another person? And all my clients hated themselves, you know? So what one has to do is interest psychic intimacy. And so what I got interested in was developing a secure attachment with self. If there's disorganized attachment between two folks, imagine what goes on inside in the battle between self and all the parts. So, you know, they're strangling, you know, this part of self that's weak and wimpy and so on. You know, I hate you, go away. You know, so there's, you know, they're attacking themselves inside. So there's got to be some way internally to be able to have parts together that work in an integrated, cohesive way. And that that has to be a prerequisite for that. So, you know, a person comes in and says, why do I keep picking men who beat me up? And the answer to that is, um, let's not talk about you in relationships. Let's not have a relationship for six months. And let's do some work on codependency and understand codependency. But codependency is one's relationship with oneself and what one can do to be able to feel a sense of, of self-love. You know, so you can say, any person who's in a relationship with me is the luckiest person in the world. How many of you think that? Okay. All right. <laughs> Next slide. <laughs> so this is where it's at. Self-empathy. Um, being able to help one's relationship with oneself. And you cannot have compassion you know, it's so weird. Our clients are so loving and so caring and so supportive to all of the other people in the room except for themselves. How do you explain that? Hearts, right? That's the only way to explain it because it makes no goddamn sense. Hearts. So there is a part that took care of their mother. And their mother had a mental illness, their mother would, you know, was being beat up by her father, the mother was depressed, so they took care of their mother. So the blueprint of how they were loved as a child was taking care of their mother. They knew that they were lovable because they took care of their mother. Got it? And so the blueprint of how we're loved as a child then manifests itself as the core of how you love as an adult. And so one part of preoccupied attachment is taking care of others, and you get really good at it. And that looks like compassion. But like we said earlier, when you're taking care of others to meet your own needs, that isn't real love. And the real, I, I one time in my career, I, I was treating 50 priests who had molested children. and you know, I'm a little Jew boy. And so I thought, oh, this should be wild, you know? And so I started going there asking them a little bit about, you know, their spirituality and, you know, how, how could they possibly hurt a child, you know, because uh, 
simple question, how could you do that? And um, what I realized was that these priests, they knew how to take care of others, but they didn't know how to receive love. They were available 24-7 to help others in a very warm, compassionate way, come my son, you know, like godlike fashion. But they were totally incapable of receiving love or asking for any help for themselves because they were taken out of their homes at age 12 and 13 and told they were God's messengers and, you know, they were deprived of proper parenting and they were a mess. And so, you know, I had to scratch my head and I began to understand that, you know, one aspect of child molestation is the incapacity to receive love except for in a, in a childlike way. So what's my point? My point is, is that that um, that uh, you can have a part that is really good at taking care of others and look very empathetic and caring. But to me, real capacity for love has with it the capacity to give and the capacity to take. And the missing piece is so many people that I've met have great difficulty receiving love, of accepting love, of being able to feel love in that kind of a way. They, 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 are, they feel out of control when they ask for something. Are they afraid they'll be refused and they don't want to venture into that space? Why is somebody afraid to ask? Um, it's pretty vulnerable. You know, what happens if the person says no? And uh, then you feel like an idiot. So, um, I don't know. I think it's vulnerability that is the problem. I think it's abandonment. Fear, fear of being left. When we meet with the patient and we listen to them. We end up telling our patients a story. And we end up telling them a story about how we experience what they're saying. And it can be a really simple story like, gosh, when I listen to you, uh, I get a sense that there's incredible sadness under the words that you're using. Or it might be some really long, drawn-out interpretation that kind of weaves things together in a really elegant and powerful way, but, not, but nonetheless tells the story of what we're hearing. And so when, when we're working from an attachment model, I, I, think, that's, I think that's what we do constantly. Uh, and, the, and the whole point of that is, is it goes back to kind of the basic, uh, basic early relationship. When we tell our patients a story, we're telling them some really important things. One is we're telling them that we see that they're there and that we hear their words and we, we experience their presence. Um, Another thing that happens is we're telling them that we, we're holding a place in our mind that contains them, which for a lot of these, uh, a lot of these folks, that's really important to, to realize that somebody else carries them in their mind is, is a profound experience. I know it sounds really kind of trite and a little too esoteric, but I really believe that, that, that that's true. Um, so I just wanted to throw that in. Uh, and, and all of that again, and, and, and the therapeutic relationship in general, uh, and I think everybody's talked about this today, is good therapy is basically good parenting. Good, empathic, intuitive parenting. Only we don't call it that. But nonetheless, it, it profoundly changes people when they're able to begin to engage that process. Make sense? Or as Mark would say, you got it? All right, so some of you thinking to yourself, okay, we're at an attachment workshop, so I've picked three guys that are all uh, mean, nasty uh, individuals, so what do I do differently, right? So, here's the answer. The answer is that give them a little test. 
and measure their attachment style. And if they are heavily on the avoid end, I'm completely uncomfortable being close with others, or the ambivalent end, I find that others are reluctant to get the closest I would like, then you're probably in the normal range because all the secures are taken. They're in close relationships already, all right? So the reservoir of people who are out there are heavily disillusioned, right? So if you feel like you've met a lot of screwed up people lately and you're single, it's probably true, okay? Now I'm talking about statistically, it's true, okay? So what do you do about that? Well, you can ask them this simple question, that's good. And if you have some attachment problems yourself, then the very best thing you can do is find somebody who's securely attached and get into a relationship with them. It'll, it'll do more to change it than anything else. But you'll be very resistant to it. And so, you know, I have this joke, I guess, myself, which is, I say, I call it ride the pony. What that means to me is this, that you are going to first, you're going to say, oh, I don't like that person anymore and ride the pony because you'll get through that stage. Then you'll say, oh, I'm not sexually interested in that person anymore. Ride the pony because you'll get through that stage. Then you'll say, well, I don't feel now what we felt, you know, the first month we were together. Ride the pony, you'll get through that stage. And why I say ride the pony is because those are all resistances and it's all fear-based. Fear has a thousand faces. And so when you find somebody securely attached, you are going to be scared to death because they're good looking, they're interesting, they uh, have all the wonderful characteristics, and you should feel passion for them. But your only passion comes from the trauma bond of what you got in childhood. And you can nev never, ever as an adult, experience the passion that you'll ever experience with somebody that you have a neurotic relationship with. So if somebody is abandoning you and driving you crazy, that's very intense. And can anything that's secure and safe feel that good? No. But nothing also can feel that bad, right? So at some point along the way, you say, I've had enough of this crap. And I'm tired of, of all the negatives, so I'm willing to give up the high highs in order to get give up the low lows. And I just want to sort of have somebody that I can just relax and not have a, a, a chaotic, uh, intense relationship with. But can you have passion in that relationship? Yes. But passion is not something that exists. Passion is something that's created. How do you create passion in a relationship? Well, I always say you, most of us spend more time fixing up our cars than we do our relationships, right? But people come in to see me, it's like, hmm, the kids take precedent, the work take precedent, clean the house take precedent. Washing the car takes precedent, but when do they ever put any energy and passion into creating the intensity in a relationship? And so relationships, if you don't prioritize them and every day put something into the relationship, it's going to run out of steam very quickly. And so people have to be taught how to maintain high passion in their relationship. Isn't that right? Yes. 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 If they don't run on empty. So you have to keep filling them up, filling them up, filling them up. But we don't teach people the necessity of that. Sometimes I'll say, well, when was the last time you told your spouse you loved them? Oh, about 10 years ago. <laughs> How come you haven't told them more often? Well, I told them that if anything changes, I'll let them know. <laughs> How often should you tell your partner you love them? How about every day? Can you imagine, you know? Is that preoccupied attachment? That you need to be told, I love you every day? When I was over in India, that's what they said. You say, you Americans, you're love crazy. You gotta be told you love every day. But you know, oh, you're in India, we have arranged marriages. And, okay. How's <laughs> the dowry system work? Right so what's the answer to the question? What's the question? If you need to be here, that uh, you're loved every day, is that an anxious attachment? No. No. Right. No. <laughs> it's good stuff. It's intimacy. Why don't you take this? 
Uh, fear often activates the attachment system, but if the primary attachment figure is the source of fear, the result is the collapse of strategies for dealing with stress. Preparing the capacity to regulate arousal by using others for self-soothing, self is that right? Fear activates the attachment system. But if the attachment figure is the source of fear, then the whole uh, attachment system collapses. <coughs> and so then you can't regulate your own arousal patterns anymore uh, for self-soothing. And so like turning to others for a source of comfort, which is the natural entity stops working. So we have no way to comfort ourselves or soothe ourselves. So what one has to do is turn to self-controlling behavior, like cutting on oneself, beating, uh, and other forms of, of uh, turning to objects rather than people. And the, you know, attachment is an innate biological mechanism that we carry around in our head. It's, it's adaptive. Uh, uh, it's what's, what's allowed us to evolve as a species. Um, and it goes back to uh, your little chimpanzee in Africa. Um, and there's a rustling in the bushes next to you. If you get curious about that, what's going to happen? It's probably a lion or a hyena or a big gorilla or whatever, and you're not going to be able to pass your genes on. So an adaptive response is you hear something unfamiliar or see something unfamiliar, creates a fear response, and then we seek proximity, which means we go to our primary caregiver uh, for a sense of safety. Uh, now, what, there, there's a second part of that, and that is uh, our attachment mechanism not only needs to turn on, like in that situation, but it also has to turn off. Because if it never turns on, what are we going to do? Or if it never turns off, what are we going to do? <laughs> That's what I think we're weird. <laughs> well, they already do. Um, yeah, uh, you're going to get stuck, it's, and in our business, it's what we call enmeshment. Uh, we get fused with other people, and we lose our sense of self. Uh, so that attachment mechanism, when it's safe, needs to be able to click off so we can separate and then go and explore our, our environment and learn really cool things and become more and more independent over time, um, but yet at the same time survive. But where things get screwy was, was in that last example. If, if the... If the your caregiver is a fearful, uh, a fearful uh, person. Uh, you, you kind of go back and forth. You're stuck in the middle. You can't seek proximity because it's not safe, but you can't go the other way because that's not safe. And you end up stuck. Make sense? And that makes us feel screwy inside. All right. So there's two things I want to say in the time we have left. I want to talk about what you do about the self system not being cohesive. And two, I want to talk a little bit about how you repair the attachment system. Before we do that, I want to just say that if you study people who have avoided attachment, let's say adolescents who are, let's say, 12 through 14, what you find out is that they have the same amount of sex, but that when they have sex, what they say is they don't feel anything, and that they're kind of numb, and that they want to keep up with their peers but they tend not to enjoy sex. Now that's really, I think, an important finding because as a sex therapist, we always assumed that, you know, that the person had the capacity to respond to touch. But when you have avoidant attachment, when you touch, when somebody touches you, it, you don't get the feeling of soothing and comforting that you would when somebody loves you touches you and comforts you, right? And so the problem in sex therapy is that you can go through all of the cognitive behavioral techniques that Masters and Johnson originated, and they're good, they're necessary, but they ain't sufficient. Because 
avoidant attachment or dismissive attachment or disorganized attachment repels closeness and physical touch. And so one has to begin to look at that. So hypersexuality and hyposexuality are actually two sides of the same coin. Hypersexuality is an intimacy disorder where you can't connect. And hyposexuality is an intimacy disorder where you can't connect. And one, you numb yourself out. The other one is, you know, you keep having the big bang and you get that hit of dopamine, but then it quickly falls. But in both cases, you really can't connect. You're not getting any oxygen. You know? So given that true, then, the question is, you know, what do you do with these folks? And in this, disorganized states have as a basis a lapse in the monitoring of discourse. What that means is that in the talking with a person, you get what I call the three-minute history. Tell me about yourself. Well, I was born in Oklahoma. I had a good family, went to school, uh, got fairly good grades, went to college, uh, married my wife, had two kids, uh, and worked for IBM. What else you want to know? Okay. That's avoidant attachment. All right? Can anybody be that small that they literally see their life in that narrative, you know? It's, it's, it's almost when you're in there, it's like, Ugh! you know? And so if that person gets into a relationship, imagine the superficiality that is going to uh, happen. All you're going to care about is your kid's soccer game and, and getting a promotion at work. You know, it's, it's, it's an emptiness. So that's avoidant attachment. Um, and when you come to talking about the things that have happened, um, the, um, I, I saw one of Lee's clients on Friday, and because uh, I was curious about him, you know, and he said to me, um, "I've been depressed, you know, for the last 15 years, severely." And I said, "Uh huh," and he says, "And I don't want to know why." Pardon me? He said, he said I, I just, like, I want it to be a small problem. I don't want it to be a big problem. And um, I don't want to do any of that work that the other clients are doing because I don't want to find out what I don't know. I said, okay, got that. Um, so what would you say next? What happened? <laughs> um, so... Uh, that's defensiveness, okay? He's got all of his defenses up, and you know, I, I'd say he's normal in the sense that most of their clients are terrified to know what they don't know, or to remember what they don't want to remember. And so, um, how do you get a person to want to remember what they don't want to remember? Well, you got to do a little work. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. I mean, usually what brings people into treatment is something is hurting, something is not working. Mm -hmm. And 12-step programs talk about the gift of desperation. I mean, if they're desperate enough, then they break through that. All right, all right, I don't want to do this, but okay. If I'm going to keep relaxing, relaxing, I guess I better work. You know, See, what I would say about that is that you listen to your client. And what, what, I'm, what I hear I'm saying is, I don't feel safe. I don't trust you. I don't trust myself. And we don't have enough of a, of a safe relationship that I can be that vulnerable. And so I'm listening with my third ear. And I, what I'm saying to myself is, OK, that makes sense. Uh, I validate that. I say, OK, it makes sense to me. And then I do something to firm up our interpersonal relationship. But when you do that, you have to be careful because if a person has avoidant attachment and you come in and you're warm and fuzzy, you know, you're going to chase that person away as fast as you can. So, you know, I, I used to think of myself as a little puppy, you know, hi, you know, and, and come in there, oh, you know, let's be friends, you know, and scare the shit out of the person, you know. So you have to find some way of tuning yourself so that 
you can attune yourself in the way Laurie was talking about, you know, that you are understand you're dealing with somebody with avoidant attachment and how to be able to earn the respect and the connection that would allow them to feel safe enough to be able to do that work. And of course, that's how you do a lot of attachment work is the attunement between you and the, and the, and the client is everything. And, you know, the, I, I've worked, Lori and I have probably worked with maybe 100 therapists, you know, on our staff over the years. And it's interesting to watch different people on our staff and you know, their styles in some way. And how their styles are good with certain kind of clients and not with others. And so being able to respect that in some way. I remember early on, uh, I had a client that had come in from Christine Courtois, who was, you know, real hot stuff. And, and I, I wanted to do a great job and, you know, send it back all in a pink bow. And, you know, we, we spent about a week together and she said, you know, I said to her, you know, I don't feel any connection with you at all. She said, you know, I don't feel any connection with you either. And I said, yeah. And I said, uh, let's take a walk and try to get a connection. So we took a walk. I said to her, you know, I think you need to see Lori, not me, because I don't, you know, I don't feel like I'm, we're connecting. And so I referred her to Lori, and she did this great work. And when she came back, she said, oh, Mark, you're the greatest therapy on earth, on earth. the greatest therapist on earth. And I said, pardon me? She said, you know, I'm so relieved that you picked up that, you know, we didn't have a connection. And I'm so glad you referred me to Lori because, you know, that's exactly what I needed in some way. And, you know, I was feeling all the shame, like, you know, how inadequate I am. But you have to respect, you know, when there is that kind of attunement and connection or not. And there are different styles of therapists with different clients. And matching yourself up is really critical in, in this kind of piece here. So, you know, this is where the, I think that you, you want to listen with your third ear and saying that you don't want to push something before it's ready to happen. Dan, Daniel Stern is one of my favorite uh, uh, theoreticians, uh, has a notion, and that is as therapists, we have to be bilingual uh, in order to work effectively with people. And what he meant by that, what he means by that is we have to be able to listen to the words uh, and take those into account, but as importantly, we have to listen to what's not being said pick up on that and attune with it and have to pay attention to the, the gestural and motor uh, and, and facial expression part of it uh, rather than the words. And I think that's what you're talking about. All right, so just going to kind of give you the cookbook now. The cookbook is that in this attachment work, there are um, four components that I want to emphasize. One of them is that um, you want to start by having everybody do a timeline. And that timeline, you write down the thoughts, feelings, and behavior from age zero on. And in that timeline, you develop a coherent narrative. Then you call your mother, father, aunt, uncle, brother, and sister, and fill in the gaps. So, you know, I've, I'm the youngest of four children. When I did this work myself, you know, I called my sister on the phone and there were all sorts of things that I didn't know. There were secrets in my family, big ones. And I didn't know any of them. And I said, you know, I'm in therapy right now. Can you talk to me about this? And, you know, my sister started laying all this stuff on me. And there were pieces of the narrative that were missing. And it was like, when that happened, it, you know, I felt a sense of emptiness inside me. But as I began to fill in the narrative and get a more cohesive narrative and put the pieces of the puzzle together, it was as if inside I could feel something coming together. It was a, a connection with myself. And I could feel more myself. And when that happened, I, I didn't have as much difficulty being alone. I, my relationship with myself improved. So a cohesive narrative is really important. Second is metacognition. Metacognition means that you're able to observe yourself. And so in metacognition, I would notice 
when I would say to myself, one of my favorite phrases was, you are so stupid, you don't have a brain in your head. Okay? And one day I decided to listen to myself and say, what did you just say? Would you say that to any other human being? You are so stupid, you don't have a brain in your head. And I realized that I was, you know, Lori says I, I tend to kill a fly with a hammer. And mostly myself. And so the what I realized was that I was so self-abusive. And so I decided from that point on that any time that I was going to be, be self-abusive, that I was going to stop and I was going to do an intervention and be able to say, don't talk that way to that little boy. Don't talk that way to that little boy. Because every time I said that, I could see the look of a little boy's face and see how hurt and disappointed he was. So I literally stopped all that. Now, if you look in the, what I'm talking about is cognition here. Now we're talking about the, um, the narrative memory, the schema change. So cognitive therapy techniques work really well for schema change. And that's what therapists are really good at. Um, so the first one was a coherent narrative. The second is increasing metacognition. Um, third is being able to recognize affect, deep structures of affect. And when you find yourself being defensive, stop and, and be able to look and be able to say, what's going on for you right now? What, what is happening? So let's say, like, uh, Nicholas is moving on to another job. Where is Nicholas? There he is. Okay. So, you know, um, I don't like that, you know, because I like Nicholas a lot. And, you know, it, it, my abandonment stuff is getting activated, right? Like, don't leave me, you know. And, you know, so I can feel that inside me. And so, you know, I'm pulling back, you know, that kind of thing. Right? So the fact that I'm metacognitive about that and I can allow myself to feel that. And so, you know, he comes up and says, you know, how are you doing today? I say, you know, go screw yourself, you know. And um, I can feel myself, you know, being... And all that is, you know, like, hey, Mark, what's up? I call that a pop quiz. You know, it's like maybe I need to do some therapy, you know. You know? And I like those moments because they're teaching moments. And each time something like that happens and I do some work with myself, my capacity to love, my capacity to connect, increases, my self increases. So I'm always looking for my defensiveness as a signal state to be able to identify my next piece of work. And so it doesn't end, it's, it's continual. So when you're doing therapy with yourself, hopefully, you teach the client how to be able to do their own work with themselves. And my self comes in and says, hey, Mark, what's up? You're acting like a jerk. And it is able then to connect with that part of self that's feeling abandoned and then do some witnessing. And so I'm able to say, what's this bringing up for you? And I can then begin to look at the issues of abandonment in my life and how it's activating something in the present. And the fact that it is means that it's unresolved. With me? Okay. So we're all doing therapy with ourselves in the next stage of this. We have to stop. No. <laughs> well, because Nicholas has to do his thing. Oh, hell, Nicholas. <laughs> well, I want to thank you guys for being really attentive, and uh, I really appreciate you spending your your after part of your afternoon with with us. Uh, so thank you, guys. Thank you.